My name is Cindy Runger, and I am your president-elect. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we have a special program for you today. One of the benefits of being uh, one of the largest clubs in the world is that we have a deep pool of business and community leaders in our membership. So today, we'll feature an all Rotarian program where we'll hear from these leaders. It'll be a panel discussion led by past president, Dorothy Bullitt, who will be joined by past president, Admiral Bill Center, past president and hotelier, Paul Ishi, and past VP of membership and attorney, Gianca Lanier. But first, let's kick this meeting off with some inspiration and song. Thomas Aros, Senior Counsel of the Outford Group, will inspire us with spoken word. And then the duo of Woodward and Bostrom with international business uh, facilitator David Woodward and attorney Trish Bostrom will inspire us with song. So Tom, come on up. Please pray with me. Our God and our Creator, it is summer, a time of warmth, a time of growth, when your creation flourishes with activity around our work, our play, and our relaxation. In the Pacific Northwest, we love our summers, and we're so grateful to you for this great gift. In our country today, leadership, style, acceptance, and respect are all topics of importance to us. Today, several will be sharing their perspectives on this, guide their voices, and attune our ears so that we may learn from one another. Help us to recognize your leadership in our lives and to learn from your guidance the skills of leadership so that others will see you through us. Finally, Lord, we pray for peace. We pray for understanding. We pray for patience. We pray that we will listen. We pray that when we speak, we will do so with love and concern for others. We have too much conflict both in our own country and around the world. It is only through you that true understanding across our world will become a reality and our conflicts will come to an end. Amen. For over 100 years, Seattle Rotary has provided a forum for prominent people from business, civic, and academia in the U.S. and around the world. And I'm thrilled that today's program is tapping into our local talent. President Mark Wright's theme this year is on leadership. And when Mark was asked, uh, when Mark asked past guest and former Starbucks president Howard Bihar who he would look to for leadership examples, he didn't miss a beat. And he named two of our very own, Father Steve Sundberg of Seattle University and Dorothy Bullitt. So we'll hear from Father Steve in the fall, and today we have Dorothy Bullitt and our other Rotary leaders. And Dorothy will explore leadership gained from her years as a leader in business, government, and nonprofit. So Dorothy has been a CEO, COO, Assistant State Attorney General, author, and now in her sixth career, she is at the University of Washington's Evans School as a distinguished practitioner and also senior lecturer where students compete to enroll in her leadership courses. So please welcome Dorothy. Thank you, Cindy, for that introduction and for filling in for Mark. And best of luck in the year ahead preparing for your presidency. So what does it take to be a leader? Uh, does it require positional authority? Does it require a certain voice, a certain look, a powerful physical presence? When Mark Wright glides to the podium, it's easy to recognize, now there is a leader. So too is Rotarian uh, to Admiral Tom Hayward, sitting here at the program table. A decorated war veteran who, as chief of naval operations, ran the Navy day to day, Tom once had huge positional authority. Like Mark, he has the appearance of a rugged matinee idol. <laughs> and he exudes charisma. A compelling speaker, it's impossible not to listen when Admiral Tom talks. So he's a leader. Do we need to be like Mark Wright? 
or Admiral Tom in order to effectively lead? Do they possess qualities less obvious than the surface traits I mentioned that you or I might emulate? Are there qualities, habits, and skills that we might cultivate in order to achieve our own particular brand of leadership? There are indeed aspects of Mark and Admiral Tom that are not immediately obvious, yet have been critical to their success. They are authenticity, practice, and respect. That's what I plan on discussing today, those ingredients of leadership that anyone in any circumstance of any background can develop. What do I mean by authenticity? Look around you. Who seems comfortable in his or her own skin? Mark? <laughs> it is possible to be unassuming in appearance and speech, yet effectively lead. If we figure out who we are, identify and build on our strengths, recognize our weaknesses, and compensate for them, we can lead. Leaders can function in many different ways and still be effective. Some leaders are highly analytical. Think Carl Agee, Lisa Mayfield, Grace Chin, Kathy Gibson. Others are especially task-oriented. Paula Houston, Admiral Center, Cindy Runger. Others focus more on relationships and harmony. Howard Bihar, Kim Moore, Sten Chrissy. Still others are more creative and spontaneous, such as Ken Grant, <laughs> Sue Nixon, Paul Ishii. Any of these approaches can result in effective leadership. The key is to determine what puts you at ease, what stresses you out, what gives you energy. When you figure this out, you will grow in confidence and others will gain confidence in you. Think about public figures. Who among them seems authentic? Whether or not you admire or despise them, you can recognize their authenticity or the absence of that authenticity. What about colleagues, fellow Rotarians? Do some seem particularly authentic? Can you sense their personal power? Remember Howard Bihar's story of his personal and professional implosion when he tried to be someone other than himself. Only by facing his vulnerabilities did Howard become a successful leader. Only then did he find his power. Dianca Lanier, past VP of membership, speaks to my class twice a year, my leadership class. Her authenticity captivates my students as she exudes self-confidence and at the same time readily confessing her mistakes. After class, students invariably announce they want to grow up to be Dianca. <laughs> but Dianca is an extrovert. Do we need to be extroverted to lead, to hold a room? No. Think of Father Sunberg, still, calm, a little shy, but captivating. He derives his strength from his essential nature, his analytical mind, his quiet, solitary habits. Steve speaks softly, yet exudes power. He leads with ease because he is utterly authentic, but he hasn't always been. When we know who we are, aware of our strengths, and conscious of our weaknesses, we can communicate with a force that will cause others to notice. When we are comfortable in our own skin, those around us can relax and become more willing to follow our lead. Now let's turn to the second point, practice. What do I mean by practice? By practice, I mean 
the process of refining the skills of leadership, public speaking, persuasive writing, critical thinking, active listening, and effective team building. By honing these skills and practicing them throughout our lives, we can become ever more effective leaders. Speaking, writing, critical thinking, active listening, largely self-explanatory. But how does a leader effectively lead a team? That is trickier. A team building process that works extraordinarily well in my classroom is one I wish I'd use more systematically when I was actually running organizations. It involves three steps. Have a conversation, define success, align members' responsibilities with adequate authority and adequate resources. When a team first assembles, members introduce themselves to one another. They share their backgrounds, personalities, work styles, pet peeves on a team, default behavior when under stress. Are, do they go passive aggressive or controlling? And their professional strengths. Then determine what do we need to achieve as a team? What will constitute success? What are the metrics, the deadlines? The agreement will give team members a neutral point of reference to return to when conflict arises or when frustration brews. As a team, openly discuss the cycle of belief. Our tendency to see and hear um, what we want to hear and see and discount information we don't. Consider ways to stop that cycle. Commit to doing this. Prepare to call on those who see the world differently, whose strengths complement ours. Seek out their perspective. Fred Weiss does this every time he comes to Rotary. As the team gets going, responsibilities assumed by each member need to be supported by adequate resources and adequate authority. Without this, individuals will be unable to fulfill their responsibilities no matter how hard they try, no matter how good their intentions. The inevitable consequence will be stress, frustration, resentment, often depression. This will cause trust to erode and an inattention to results and failure. Consider some of the issues at play right now in the White House. Consider some of the issues in play right now in your organization. Planning early when nobody's under particular stress. Admitting pet peeves. Admitting default stress behaviors. And aligning, aligning each team member's responsibility with adequate authority, with adequate resources, and with firm deadlines will help unite the team and achieve success. In today's society, whether we work for an organization or volunteer, we need to speak effectively, we need to write persuasively, think critically, listen actively, and build functioning teams. Perfecting these skills will equip us to lead, whatever our role. Practicing these skills will increase our self-confidence, refine our ability to communicate, help us understand those around us better, and make us more comfortable in our own skin. Admiral Hayward, comfortable in his own skin, has worked hard throughout his distinguished career in and out of the, the Navy to practice the skills of leadership. Now in his 90s, he continues to refine what he has to offer. Admiral Tom's never coasted on the superficial traits I first mentioned. His leadership developed over time through constant effort, practice, introspection, self-improvement, keen awareness, actively listening, learning about the subject matter of his work and the needs and concerns of his people. But one doesn't need to be an admiral or a TV news anchor to do, it, to do this. Anyone can practice these skills. We can deliberately refine the skills of leadership if we are unemployed 
or working at a job different than the job of our dreams. We can do these things if we can no longer work at all. Which brings me to the subject of respect. Why is respect a tenant of leadership? In the, in the public, private, and nonprofit sectors, and life outside the workplace, the best leaders exhibit certain behaviors that signal and engender respect. These include turning up on time, following through on commitments, however small, treating others with courtesy, regardless of position, and living by the four-way test. Respect requires us to recognize one another's humanity. This is something our speaker, Race Bouillon, managed to do after being shot in the face by a white supremacist. After Race lost everything, he managed to regain his power and find new purpose by recognizing his assailant's humanity. Patrick Burr, who I spoke of once before, was my high school sweetheart. A single dad, he never went to college. Instead, he worked nights um, running a, a small business cleaning restaurant kitchens until cancer and heart disease knocked him out of the workplace in his mid-50s. When we reunited, Patrick was terminally ill, yet still captivating. During his last 15 months, I watched him live with grace, integrity, and humor as he navigated a slew of challenges. He integrated the disparate elements of his life, reconciled with those he distanced, comforted those in distress, and practiced tolerance and forgiveness. Though he was in constant pain, Patrick inspired others by example, befriending people at every strata of society, from homeless addicts to the civic elite, with his unique ability to cut straight to their humanity. He was dying, yet he was powerfully authentic, an exceptional listener, a superb communicator. He became a unifying force in both our families large and extended clans of, of strong, diverse personality and viewpoints. Authenticity, practice, respect, not money or possessions, not getting perfect grades or leading an edifice to his professional achievements, but authenticity, careful practice, and consistent respect won Patrick admiration. Hundreds came to his funeral, young and old, black and white, prisoners and judges, outcasts and executives. They came not because of achievements on a resume, but because Patrick was authentic, respectful, because he, like Race Bouillon, had connected with their humanity, because he had become a leader in life. Everyone has the potential to become a leader in some realm. Some of you, like Mark Wright or Admiral Hayward will have a head start because you possess charisma, presence, and a compelling voice, maybe height. <laughs> yet all of us can get there by discovering our authentic selves, our natural communication styles, cultivating our strengths, recognizing then mitigating our weaknesses, practicing the skills of leadership, and treating others with respect by recognizing their humanity. As we do, we will grow more confident. The people around us will begin to follow our lead. And if we are lucky, we, like Patrick, will engender love in the process. This club is full of wonderful leadership examples. So it is my pleasure to invite to the stage three of them, three of our colleagues. Each has a distinctive style, distinctive career, each is effective, and each is a recurring guest presenter in my leadership course. The first is Admiral Bill Center, past president of Seattle Four, who will deliver a condensed talk on taking care of my people, our people, your people. <laughs> Paul Ishii will follow, past president of the club, 
and recently retired general manager of the Mayflower Hotel. He will discuss intuitive leadership. And Dianca Lanier, Senior Director of Nordstrom's Legal Department and recent VP of Membership, uh, will explore motivational leadership through an unusual prism. Each will speak at the podium, then move over to these chairs, and after we're all done, we'll take your questions on any topic. And as you're listening, think about what would be your special message of leadership if you could deliver it. And if you are so inspired, make a little video and we'll post it on the website. What she said, proud to call her a mentor and friend, a great encourager. You've probably never given it much thought, but in the same sense that we might say the core expertise of a medical doctor is medicine, or that of a lawyer is the law, the core expertise of a military officer is leadership. Leadership is our primary tool for getting the job done. Now there may be some here who think that military officers don't have to be real leaders, that all we have to do is give orders which must be obeyed without question. Works that way, right, Admiral? <laughs> it's never really been like that, and it certainly hasn't been like that since we became an all-volunteer force back in the mid-70s when Admiral Tom was the CNO. Even in this room full of proven leaders, there are likely some who are still not entirely convinced that you can actually teach leadership. Well, years of research have shown that we can learn leadership in the classroom and then go on to sharpen our skills in the laboratory of the real world. Turns out the military is a terrific real world leadership laboratory. I thought you might be interested in what I teach my students. So here is a two day seminar condensed into three minutes. <laughs> Way back in 1963, I was taught three foundational leadership principles set forth by the eminent military historian Douglas Southall Freeman. Freeman observed that the best leaders know their stuff, that they are people of high character, and they take care of their people. Knowing your stuff refers to the how-tos and jargon of your business, the ability to provide clear guidance, ask good questions, and understand what you're being told by the people you lead. And as important as that stuff may be, character comes first. Character is the bedrock of leadership. Trust is built on character, and we simply will not follow people we don't trust. But what did Freeman mean by take care of your people? He observed the most effective military leaders saw to it that their troops were well-fed, well-clothed, well-armed, that they had a good blanket and a warm, dry place to sleep. Of course, it wasn't always possible to do all or sometimes even any of those things, but good leaders made it a priority, and they still do. As the Marines like to say, officers eat last. In today's workplace, good leaders like you ensure your troops are treated with respect and dignity that they have a clean, safe place to work, the tools to do their job, adequate time off, personal time when needed, and the best possible pay and benefits. But at the end of the day, if you really expect your workforce to be as committed and hardworking as you are, there has to be something more in it for them. That something is your genuine commitment to helping them achieve their own personal and professional goals. Taking care of your people includes being every bit as devoted to their advancement as you expect them to be to your mission, goals, and objectives. That, my friends, is the secret sauce, the modern day indispensable element embodied in Dr. Freeman's injunction to take care of your people. For me, from my vantage point, leadership means 
successfully encouraging people to willingly do things they would not otherwise do, unleashing maximum performance, and helping them achieve their fullest potential and personal goals in the process. Aim high, be all you can be, fulfill your destiny. For military leaders, those aren't just recruiting slogans, they're cultural imperatives. My time's up, thank you, I'm done. <laughs>I got to follow an admiral. <laughs> All right, intuitive leadership. Thank you, Dorothy, for motivating me to explore this idea further, and my fellow Rotarians for letting me share the podium today. I got four minutes, so let's rock and roll. This form of leadership starts really early. My dear wife, Jane, is a first grade teacher and sees her children bossing other kids and her at ages at six and seven. Intuitive leadership. It's embedded in all of us. Here's some reading and view material that I suggest. Blink, The Power of Thinking Without Thinking by Malcolm Gladwell. An Ordinary Man by Paul Rusasabagina, also known as Hotel Arwanda. Amazing Story, Intuitive Leadership at Its Finest Moment. And a film titled Sully, played by Tom Hanks. Now, how many people have you seen that? Okay. A seasoned pilot does the right thing at the right time and at the last moment, intuitively. Now that is making decisions on the fly. <laughs> All right. Intuitive leadership is what I say, it's a tactical form of leadership and it worked well for me as a hotelier. It's an industry that's fickle and unpredictable. New guests check in and out every day, so you always get a new deck of cards. Deaths, love affairs gone bad or good, suicides, drug overdoses, stupidity, heart attacks, robberies, funerals, missing airplanes, not being able to pay a bill, or just needing help in every way, every day. <laughs> Intuitive leadership begins and ends in a full service hotel. I've been in the business for over 30 years, and this past February, I left. I worked at a small family owned historic hotel for 18 years. It was a David versus Goliath situation, competing against places like this, Hilton's, Marriott's, etc. It was like the movie Home Alone, and I enjoy the independence. Our survival was based on being adaptive, flexible, original, relevant, loving your employees and guests, and intuitiveness was a Swiss army knife in our toolbox. Now here's a few of the tools that I have identified as aspects of intuitive uh, leadership. The LCD, the lowest common denominator. Do not lose touch with the LCDs of your business. In mine, it was smelling your shampoos, bed sheets, tasting your food and wine sleeping in the bed you bought, taking a shower in the bathroom remodeled, keep in touch literally with your product, get your MBWA degree, otherwise known as management by wandering around. <laughs> with all the distractions these days, people can lose their sense of smell, taste, and touch of their business. So this is what I call the LCD, the main blade in your Swiss Army knife, also known as your common sense. For instance, there's many emergency protocol policies, you know, some bolt, light sticks, radios, tape, hammers, radios, gloves, whatever, things like that. LCD, what do you get? Water, garbage bags, toilet paper, and booze. <laughs> Hygiene and thirst are the first things that go to hell in a natural disaster, so if you have a toilet tank or a pool, drink it. So think low, I mean really low. Think lowest common denominator when making any sand plans. Is there gas in the car? Is the device plugged in? No kidding. I uh, worked at one hotel, the pool was never cleaned. I said, why? Because this is it took too long to fill it back up. I said, well, how did you fill it up? With one hose. I said, have you tried using two? <laughs> Round pools, forget it. The math's even worse. So buy a hotel with a square pool. <laughs> All right, copy others and refine it. Don't be proud. Don't panic. Count to 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Then panic. Let that adrenaline go through the system, then assess the situation, find good mentors, role models, and be a good role model yourself. Look at the person next to you. They are a treasure of advice and wisdom, one of the biggest gifts of rotary. Being a small company and I the chief executive, where would I get my on ongoing education? From you. Practice diversity in your workplace. Combo pizzas are better than just plain cheese. So are 12 assorted donuts. Are you faking diversity or doing it? 
say you do not know, you'll save a lot of time and big mistakes, provide lots of chances and break the rules, make your employees and guests feel special because they are. You gave me a chance to be your president. Open door policy, critical. Many employees do not have this gift at home or in their daily lives. Knowing that you can be heard is and be respected, it's a powerful and healing thing. Confirmation, that's important too. You don't always have to find something new. Confirming what you do is just as important. You must have a sense of humor. Know when to retreat or even give up. Practice saying sorry and thank you. Practice hospitality, civility, and community, the basics of a Rotarian. Wrapping it up, LCD, copy and refine, don't panic. I have a few more, see me later. Four minutes. Respectful leadership is healing and rewarding. As a thoughtful and respectful leader, you can make our world better one person at a time. Here at Seattle 4, you all made me a better leader and a better person. Love you all. Amen. All right, I got to follow an admiral and then Paul. <laughs> Good afternoon. I want to start off by saying that I've been really fortunate, extremely fortunate, to have a broad array of leadership experiences beginning very early on in my career. I've been a military officer and enlisted soldier, board president for Habitat for Humanity, Seattle South King County, president of the oldest minority bar association in the state of Washington, the Lauren Miller Bar Association, and senior director of Nordstrom's legal department. And I've even at least attempted to lead my two daughters. <laughs> Through these, all of these experiences, I've made a lot of mistakes, but I've also come to believe that motivational leaders are the most effective leaders because they have the ability to do three things. First, continuously improve. They're wide open to criticism and lifelong learning. They develop people. They recognize that if you don't invest in the development of others, people will not follow you. And if you don't have any followers, you're not a leader. Finally, they earn respect. They know that a title will not sustain you these days. You cannot make people do things they don't want to do. Eventually, they will sabotage you, and you'll probably deserve it. What has been most interesting to me in my leadership journey is that I'm convinced that there's no special skill set needed to be a motivational leader. Rather, you just simply have to be committed to expressing heartfelt respect and appreciation for people. The result is that they will ultimately reciprocate this behavior and deliver maximum productivity, and that is a truly motivational leader. So I began formally learning about effect of heartfelt express, expressing heartfelt leadership and appreciation when I stumbled upon a book about 14 years ago. I was in marriage counseling at the time. <laughs> the author is Dr. Gary Chapman. And most of you have heard of this book. It's called The Five Love Languages. Over the past 14 years, my approach to leadership has been to apply what Dr. Chapman describes as the platinum rule do unto others what they would have done unto themselves. So essentially, my approach is simple, to identify the love languages in others. Now there's five love languages. The first are words of affirmation. This is about what I say to people. Complimenting someone, not simply to get what I want, but for the genuine purpose of developing people for the task at hand. Mark Twain might have expressed the power of a compliment best when he said, I can live for two months on a good compliment. The second is quality time, which also means quality conversation. And this is what I hear from people. I believe that when people feel that they've been heard, they're simply more apt to listen. Three and four are acts of service and receiving gifts. This is about what I do for people. Receiving gifts, the person speaking this love languages sees rewards as a visible symbol of my appreciation and respect for his or her contributions. Acts of service, well this boils down to showing my respect and appreciation for someone else by demonstrating that I would never ask them to do anything I wouldn't do myself. This is very much the Nordstrom way. And finally, physical touch. 
This is about how I make people feel. Now, while I'll admit physical touch can be tricky in the pr professional environment, when done right, it can be the most powerful language of all. Touch has the power to help someone who feels inadequate feel worthy, and it can signal acceptance and build confidence. Put simply, to me, someone who cares enough to find out what truly motivates other people exemplifies heartfelt respect and appreciation and defines what I believe is a truly motivational leader. So thank you very much for hearing all of us. And I'd like to open it up for conversation, for questions and um, Q&A now. <laughs> Jane. This is fabulous. Thank you. Um, how do you find out what people's love languages are? Thank you. That's a great question. So what I do is I spend time talking to people and listening to people, right? As Dorothy said in the beginning, open up very early on in the relationship, right? Work relationship with colleagues is sitting down to listen to them. I don't wear, I learned very early on in the Army when I got my first butter bars pinned on me, I thought I could tell people what to do, um, and they would listen, and they didn't. Uh, <laughs> so uh, after that, I had to change my approach, and I've learned that just talking to people and listening to them, really everything Dorothy said, I think most importantly, being vulnerable to them um, is how I get them to share with me what their love language is. <laughs> I just ask them, uh, and then that becomes part of the dynamic in, in their um, functioning team. Okay, so I'm sorry we're, so, we're out of time. Oh, I would love to go further, but hopefully you guys can um, so, you know, stick around for more um, questions. So I will end with the, the last question, and if you, both, if you all can go through just really quickly, what is each of your love languages? Oh, okay. Uh, words of affirmation. <laughs> Come on, Bill. <laughs> be vulnerable, yeah. I, I try to be conversant in all love languages. <laughs> I have to ask Dorothy because she's the one that knows the answer to this. What's my love language? I think words of affirmation are your love language. <laughs> she gives me a lot of words of affirmation, so she's serious about that. <laughs> Be yourself. Words of affirmation. Okay, thank you very much. Let's thank our panelists, Dorothy Bullitt, Bill Center, Paul Ishii, and Dianca Lanier.